Professor Nathan Lent studied biology at the St. Louis University and then completed his PhD at St. Louis University School of Medicine in pharmacological and physiological sciences. Now, PhDs need residencies too. So he did his postdoctoral training in cancer genomics at NYU and loved New York so much that he stayed and he's now a professor at John Jay College in Manhattan and the director of the Honors Program. His book, Human Errors, A Panorama of Our Glitches, From Pointless Bones to Broken Genes, discusses the beauty of our flaws. We are not the well-oiled machines that we think we are. This is part two out of three of my interview with Professor Lentz. In this episode, we talk about how anthropologists have actually informed our current knowledge of nutritional sciences from the perspective of how were we designed to eat. We then get into the weeds with a few medical specialties. We start with ENT in this episode, something near and dear to my heart, and we discuss how the recurrent laryngeal nerve ended up in the chest, why humans are the only primates who choke on their food, and what the heck do scientists really do? He maintains the Human Evolution blog, and his podcast is called This World of Humans. He can be found at NathanLentz.com. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. This episode is brought to you by Orange County Bookkeepers Healthcare Accounting, an all-in-one accounting firm for small healthcare businesses and private medical practices. One thing that I personally love about OCB accountants is that they are QuickBook professionals with over 20 years' experience focusing specifically on healthcare. They utilize a tailored approach individualized to your needs. They're a full-service bookkeeping firm specializing in accounting, payroll, taxes, and financial planning. And for our listeners, for a limited time, they are offering 25% off their services for the first three months. You can visit them at ocbmed.com, that's O-C-B-M-E-D, or call at 833-671-3873 or 949-215-6200. And check out the show notes for more information. Dr. Nathan Lentz, thanks so much for being on the show again. It is my pleasure. So how have the anthropologists driven our current knowledge of nutritional science? That's a great question, because I I think a lot of the the public gets a little frustrated by every five or 10 years, um, we're told a different diet is the way to eat and minimize this and maximize that. And um, I think suddenly reached clarity by trying to answer the question of what were we eating as we evolved, as our metabolism evolved? And I don't mean over a few thousand years, but over millions of years. And the anthropologists, the evolutionary anthropologists, have have made a lot of progress in understanding what we ate really uh, as we transitioned out of the rainforest into the grasslands and became, um, you know, omnivorous, opportunistic feeders. And what they've really shown us is that the vast majority of the world's cuisine right now, every, every culture that you go to, the main staple food is carbohydrates. And they put other things on top of that, but we are getting something like 70 to 80% of our calories from carbohydrates. And that just wasn't the case um, for millions of years of our history. Carbohydrates were always there, but they were a much smaller percentage of our total calories. And so what we find in a carbohydrate-based diet is that the blood sugar swings a lot more. So you get spikes in blood sugar, which are also followed by troughs because the insulin response gets exaggerated. And so you have this really up and down blood sugar insulin reaction after every meal instead of a more of a slow roll. And the advantage of the slow roll is number one, you don't get hungry between meals as much. You can go long periods without eating, without being consumed by that hunger. And then also most importantly, the way that it affects the energy metabolism of the excess calories that you have after a meal. So a slow roll of glucose and insulin actually promotes um, this, the sh- temporary storage, uh, storage of calories in the form of carbohydrates, glycogen, and so forth. But a spike um, promotes long-term deposition of calories in the form of fat. So paradoxically, a high-carbohydrate uh, diet is a good way to get fat, and a high-fat diet 
is not. <laughs> it seems paradoxical, but you know, these, these molecules are all interconverted into one another. So you can eat carbs and it gets turned into fat by your body. But I think the anthropologists really led the way by looking how we evolved and how hunter gatherers eat now. And it was really the invention of farming that produced all these carbohydrates as a, as a key part of our diet. I guess they were much harder to come by previously. And also you were able to mass produce them and refine them. Yes, yes, exactly. The, the, the mass production in the form of farming is what allowed it because carbohydrates were always there. We ate uh, tubers and roots. Um, but imagine, you know, all the digging that you have to do to get, you know, one root that you then usually have to cook. And, you know, it's just not going to be a big part of everyone's diet. Um, and sugars especially, you know, would have been great when they were found here and there, but it would they would have been sprinkled through our diet. Uh, whereas nowadays, the, the amount of sugar that you can eat in one big breakfast can be more than hunter-gatherers eat in, in several weeks. Well, also, even if it is sugar, like if it's, if it's sugar in the form of an apple, the apple has fiber in it. Fiber slows gastric emptying, mm -hmm. in this, and, and fat does the same thing. They slow gastric emptying, so that's that slow roll that you're talking about. Exactly. And so one way you can, if you have a lot of sugar, just minimize how much it is per meal and fill it with other things that can help. But really, just, just the total amount of sugar in an apple well, also, you have to realize the apples we eat now are not like the apples <laughs> we were eating for, uh, for most of our history, right? Cultivation has made them big, uh, rich, and much more sweet. Um, so the amount of sugar that we previously got from apples was much less also. Yeah, but my apples have a little sign on them that says non-GMO. Right? <laughs> they haven't been GMO. genetically there's, modified. <laughs> there's almost no food in the supermarket now that hasn't been genetically modified through, nat through artificial selection. So we selected apples to be very big, very sweet. Um, the original apples would have been more closer to the size of a large cherry and um, not near as sweet, much more mealy and fibrous. And um, I don't think almost any of the food that we evolved eating would be very palatable to us now. Yeah, so is that what you're saying? Is are, are you saying we should be eating roots and grubs? No, I'm not, actually. I think you can eat a modern diet uh, that is better balanced uh, in terms of the of the macromolecules. So you know what I eat a lot of is nuts. I eat a lot of nuts, um, especially for for lunch. And I, I tend tend to reduce meat for environmental reasons. I do think meat is a healthier way to eat, but I can't justify it right now in terms of just for environmental reasons. So I try to substitute with nuts. That's what I think is a is a you get a lot of fat, a lot of protein, and I can have two pieces of fruit and a couple handfuls of nuts for lunch, and it's really, I'm good until dinner. Now, I'm hungry at dinner time, don't get me wrong, but I think it's a, it's a healthier way to eat, and I don't get those spikes in insulin that cause you to become ravenously hungry in between meals. To use modern nomenclature, that would be hangry. Be hangry, hangry exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> and I also don't get tired. I don't need a nap in, during the day either, because that's another thing that the sugar and insulin spikes will do to you is just zap your, your energy. Yeah, when I was a medical student, it just baffled me that after lecture, I would go to Wegmans, get a big sub that had all this white bread on it, mm -hmm. and and then I'd, I'd be so tired. I'd have to take, I was useless. I couldn't yeah. study. I'd fall asleep. It was, and I had no idea that, you know, the cause and effect was right in front of me, but I, but I had no idea. Yeah. And now it's, you know, now it's become, but now I'm so attuned to that. Like, it, I, I, I only... The only time I'll have something that's that's carb rich is is when I know I'm going to be going to bed soon, just because I'm so like I can't have something like that and then go on to start seeing patients. It just doesn't work. It is good for falling asleep. That's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And Thanksgiving, everyone says, "Oh, it's the tryptophan." Yeah. Really? No, definitely not. Really? The no, it's because we're <laughs> gluttons and we get a big sugar spike followed by the insulin spike, and then we're and we're storing fat. Okay. Yeah. No. So, and Thanksgiving dinner. That yeah, it's not the turkey. It's the stuffing. It's the, it's the, oh, I think it's the stuffing, the stuffing yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're stuffed. So is, is, are there any other tidbits that you have for our, for a physician audience here about uh, what we've, about our current status of nutritional science based on how we've evolved? Yeah, well, I would say that um, to throw away any of the hard rules, there's no, there's no need for three meals a day. Uh, there's no need for getting enough carbs or anything like that. The, the key thing I say is to minimize carbs, maximize proteins and fats. And then also, and this is the key one, is listen to your body. Try different things. Like for me, breakfast just doesn't work. But there are some people who, who are, eat a very healthy diet and breakfast is part of it. So if you can't do away with breakfast, then just find a healthy breakfast to eat that's protein and fat and not carbohydrate. For me, no breakfast um, is, it works well for me. So listen to your body and follow the cues and give any diet a little bit of time to work. Any, as you reduce carbohydrates, 
So you're not going to like it at first. Giving up lunch, for example, was very hard for me to do. But once I've done it, now I can do it any, any day I want. I can't usually do it two days in a row, <clears throat> but I just listen to your body. That's what I would say. And I think not being dogmatic, uh, that's one of the mm-hmm. issues that I have with like the paleo diet or the keto yeah. diet is that, you know, in, in order to stay in ketosis, just the the mental energy that it takes mm-hmm. to to do something like that. I mean, if you're a high performance athlete and you're like trying this for a reason, but like, I don't know, to recommend that to your, to, to patients to, that's just completely overhauling yeah, standard and, and, of living. And, and, and that's just, not evolutionarily correct either because we were very opportunistic. We did sometimes feast. We did sometimes eat, uh, you know, the rare foods and, and we got a, a windfall of this, that, or the other. That's okay. It's all okay. What's that saying? Everything in moderation, including moderation. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I have dessert every now and then. I love pizza. You know, you just have to work it into a regular routine of healthy, of healthy foods. Uh, you of, live in of, New York. How can you avoid pizza? It's yeah. And I, I wouldn't, wouldn't dream of, of giving up pizza. <laughs> All right, so let's let's move on to the different specialty sections of your of your book. Mm-hmm. So one thing that's near and dear to my heart, otolaryngology. Uh, you mentioned the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and I and I thought that was really entertaining because you know we do thyroidectomies, and so when you're doing a thyroid, when you're removing a thyroid, you have to find the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and you know you're explaining it to a patient before surgery about how this is a risk, and it never made sense. Mm-hmm. that it ended up just getting hooked under and coming back up. And, 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 and I think of like, you know, in the book, you brought up what it would look like in a giraffe or a brontosaurus, right? right. Like, like, it's just that nerve has got to be so long in that animal. Yeah. But so how did it end up that way? Well, so the, the, the nerve makes a path from the brain to the, uh, the larynx, to the voice box. And um, in its earliest incarnation, you got to remember that these, these uh, cranial nerves, these are ancient, ancient nerves. The spinal nerves and cranial nerves go back way back in our evolutionary history. And so if you go back to the earliest incarnation of this recurrent laryngeal nerve, it made a shot from the, it was, it was in fish. We're talking about fish here. So the, the shot, the, the drive that it took to go from the brain to the gills, because our larynx uh, evolved from the gills. And that was this nice straight shot, very short. Um, and they didn't, they didn't, they don't have a neck or a chest, fish don't. And so as our heart, and they, but they do have a closed circulatory system, they do have a heart. And as the heart migrated away from the brain uh, in the development of tetrapods, uh, you know, amphibian, reptiles, amphibians, and so forth, um, you sort of elongated and created a true neck, a true chest uh, that's separate from the head. So the heart and the brain started to become separate from one another. Well, this nerve sort of meanders through the vessels of the heart, even in fish, but it it makes a straight shot. But as the heart moved backwards, or I should say downwards, um, if we're talking about anatomical position in in, in the more inferior position, it brought that nerve with it because that nerve gets tangled around the aorta, the aortic arch. And so developmentally, if you think about tweaking genes with random mutations, it was just too much of an ask to untangle that using random mutations. And so the solution that not a solution, just what happened was that the nerve just got pulled into the chest. And so this nerve goes from the brain loops around the aorta uh, because it exits um, the vagus nerve. It's in the vagus nerve bundle uh, in the spinal cord. And then it it comes out in the chest and then comes back up to the neck. Um, You know, the other nerves uh, in our neck don't do that. This was the only one that there was just, just bad luck and it didn't, it didn't sort it out. But as far as we know, Every vertebrate has this problem, every single one, every single tetrapod, every reptile, every mammal. So, uh, and we've dissected the giraffe and, and you can see this, um, this several meters long nerve that could be measured in centimeters. It's measured in meters um, in the giraffe. And so we would assume no one's ever fossilized. We've never seen a fossilized version of this in the brontosaurus and, and you know, in the other brachiosaur- the brachiosaurus, the other dinosaurs in that family. But we would just assume by extrapolation that they would have this. Uh, several meters long at that point, probably double digit meters long recurrent laryngeal. It doesn't cause problems day to day, but what it does cause is that, as you mentioned, uh, neck surgery, but also chest surgery, cardiothoracic surgeons have to look out for that nerve as well, because if they accidentally cut it while performing a bypass or anything else, the, the person will learn to, will need to learn to talk again. And potentially, I, I'm, I'm actually not entirely sure how 
permanently disabled you are without that nerve. That's something you would know, I imagine. Yes. Yeah. This, this is something. This is something that we treat. So, so ultimately, what happens is if the nerve does get cut, then half of the cord, you know, that cord doesn't move, right? Mm-hmm. And so, what generally happens is it becomes fixed in a medial position. So that you bring one, you can bring your other cord over to the other and then you can have a voice. But for a while, you just have a very breathy voice because your vocal cords don't close, Mm -hmm. which means you have to take a breath between almost every word. You can be at slightly higher aspiration risk because purpose of the larynx is a valve to prevent aspiration. Mm -hmm. But And then one of the surgeries that we can do, we can actually put some uh, filler into the cord if it's not getting medialized to in order to force it to towards the middle so that the other half so that the valve becomes competent again and you can you can create a voice and you can can prevent aspiration we put like similar to what you would use to get rid of someone's wrinkles Um, okay like restylane and then uh you know and then there's more permanent surgery if you're finding that 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 the paralysis because it was cut rather than just stretched and paretic so that's that's how we that's how we manage a, a vocal cord paralysis so so speaking of which speaking of the the valve the the larynx being a valve to prevent aspiration. Something else. <laughs> I was just going to say that is choking risk. Right, right. right. I mean, that's, that's something... really the elephant in the room when you're talking about anything going on in the neck. Is that the common tube for food and air? Uh, you know, what could go wrong? The aspiration risk that humans face is actually greater than most of our relatives, especially in early childhood. I mean, choking is a is a hazard, as an extreme hazard in our species, and it's because our throat is so shallow. It's really shallow. Uh, And so you have, in a very small amount of space, you have a lot of work to do to make sure that the food gets into the right place and the water especially, uh, and the lungs don't take that on. And just just the fact that we have a throat uh, where the food and air start off on the same path is really an unfortunate design. And there's there's a lot of downside to it. And in fact, if you look at birds, for example, whose, whose nostrils make a direct shot to their lungs, bypassing the throat altogether, they have it so much better than we do. And, and, and snakes as well. So birds and reptiles, most of them actually have a separate conveyance of air from their nostrils. So if you see a snake that's halfway through swallowing something, you're not like, oh my gosh, how is he possibly breathing? He's breathing just fine. And so are the birds too. I've seen a bird with a, a fish sort of stuck in its throat. And while it needs to, it does need to get that fish up or down, it's not going <laughs> yeah. to asphyxiate it while it's figuring that out. And so, in fact, I saw this one bird on the beach one time I was watching and he made about five or six tries to swallow this fish, kept wetting it in the salt water and trying everything. Each attempt took several minutes and eventually gave up. He couldn't, he couldn't swallow this fish. Oh, that's gotta be um, frustrating. Yeah. Very frustrating, but he wasn't asphyxiating. You know, he had no trouble breathing while he was trying to do that. And there wasn't that urgency as if I don't swallow this, I'm going to die. Yeah. Right. Right. So um, we don't, we have that problem where we can easily get food lodged and if it gets lodged in our throat, the, the nasopharynx joins um, as well, of course. So there's no, the nostrils aren't any help if you're, if you're stuck in your throat. So that's, that in of itself is poor design. But the other apes share that design with us, and as, as all mammals do. But the other apes have much more room to sort the flow of traffic into two lanes, so to speak. So the epiglottis has more room to do its work in covering the, the, the glottis, but we don't. So what happened was that our larynx migrated upwards uh, over the last really fairly recently, the last couple hundred thousand years, maybe a million years, it migrated upward. Now that migration is measured in millimeters, not maybe centimeters, but at the same time, there's just not a lot of room back in in the throat anyway. So that was precious room. And our babies, as we know, are, are born quite incapable. And so choking is just a major hazard that really has to do with the anatomical design of the throat. And actually when you're born, your larynx is much higher. Mm -hmm. I see, I see a lot of patients, newborns come in with laryngomalacia, which is this, this just a floppy larynx. So their larynx makes a lot of noise when they're breathing. Mm-hmm. And so they come in and the parents often complain that their kid is congested because it sounds like it's coming from the nose. And the reason it sounds like it's coming from the nose is because the larynx sits so high. Uh-huh. Um, and, and the reason is because they, you know, if you've ever tried drinking while you're lying on your back, it doesn't mm-hmm. work. Right? Like, you're going to yeah. aspirate, but they do. They drink lying on their back all the time, and they do, and they do just fine. And and I think that's the, the the reason that the larynx needs to be so high initially, and then and then it descends. So is is the reason that it ended up elevated in us? Is that because it's a more finely tuned communication apparatus, and that's why it yeah. needed to be higher? 
That's certainly the the thinking. It, you know, it's one of these things in evolution where you have an, an explanation that seems to fit all the data, but you can't know for sure without a time machine exactly what was going on uh, in terms of the selective pressure. But what we do know is that ha- having a larynx that's higher in our throat allows us to make a much richer variety of vowel sounds. And so certainly none of the other apes, but most of the other hominins, as we model what their throat looked like, they wouldn't have been capable of the kind of speech that we can make. So the fricatives and the other sounds that are made by the puckering of your soft palate and your throat, and certainly the click sounds of some of the earliest spoken languages are simply just not possible without that larynx being very, very high. And so, um, and, and the reason why is that you shape your throat right before the air gets to the larynx, and then you have that, you just have a lot more in your toolkit. And so um, most, and Neanderthals had this uh, fairly high throat as well. So some people infer that they must have been able to speak because we can't think of any other advantage uh, for that high voice box. Because clearly Um, it's a disadvantage. And otherwise it's a disadvantage. Yeah, we we can understand all the costs, but the only benefit we can can see is in speech. Um, And there's disagreements about that too, because a lot of people think that actually gestural communication probably drove language. I, I don't see those as either or. I think gestures were a big part of our communication toolkit, but we transitioned more towards vocal auditory communication in the last million or so years. And I think that was when the fossil record supports the idea of the, of the, the throat migrating upwards and upwards. And particularly the hyoid bone is, is generally the easiest way to do this because larynx uh, doesn't fossilize as well, really at all, but the hyoid bone does. And so these are inferences that are drawn from the position of the hyoid bone in the throat. Yeah, the hyoid bone's interesting because we, we remove it with impunity. Right. It's one of the few bones that's really not attached to any other bones, right? It's the scaffold for the musculature involving the larynx, as, as I understand it. But but even like if someone has a tharoglossal duct cyst, which is, you know, the, th- the thyroid starts off in the back of the tongue and then it, extends, it descends to below the larynx, it sometimes leaves a little bit of trail of uh, what becomes a cyst behind that then needs to be removed. And in remo- you, so we remove the hyoid bone with the cyst and it greatly decreases the Recurrence risk. It's called the cyst trunk procedure. And do, and do, can they speak normally? Totally fine. Totally. Now I wonder can, though if yeah. that if that's because they've had the benefit of proper development up to that point. So if you had removed a hyoid bone at birth or in utero, probably not as much. Or or what do you think? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. An interesting question that will never be answered. Right. Um, well, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, you could do, you could think about experimental ways to do it, not on humans, but yeah. you're right. It, it wouldn't give you quite the developmental question we're asking. So yeah, the, as far as we, we don't, we don't know what it's, what its value is. There's, you know, it's, it's interesting. We learn these things and now talking to you, especially with your, with your book, it turns out that the answers that we're sometimes given are just based in conjecture, not based in evolutionary development. Like, you know, I learned that the hyoid bone developed and really it only seems to function in roaring in lions. And so it doesn't, it doesn't have a role, but, but it did have a role. And then maybe, maybe it doesn't any longer. Or maybe it does in development, but not then once you're developed. And the right. same thing with, with the sinuses, right? That's, that's something that you and I have been communicating about trying to, trying to figure out. Cause what we learn is, well, it could be to help re- in, increase the resonance of your voice, or it could be to lighten your skull or it could be to um, a crumple zone. Like if you're, a, if you're a primate swinging from a tree and you smash into a tree and you break your sinuses, you, you know, it, it functions like a crumple zone. So you don't die and maybe you can go on to reproduce, although probably not likely. Yeah, I mean, I would be skeptical of all of those explanations. And not, again, not that I think they're, you know, terrible stories, but it's just hard to see selection at work in, in cases like that. But what's interesting about medicine and evolutionary biology is they both have this tendency, practitioners like, like, like yourself and, my, and myself, of creating stories that fit the data. And usually these are just fanciful stories. But actually when medicine and evolutionary biology come together, and they, I think the stories that they tell together actually tend to be much more accurate than either one does separately. Because evolutionary biologists think about selection, and they think about ancestral environment, and Physicians think about how the body works right now. And I think when you put those two perspectives together, especially if you have a good background in anatomy, I think is when you really, really get insights in how the body works. And, and, and to me, the, the hero of all of this is Dan Lieberman, if you know him at Harvard. Um, he really approaches the anatomy of the human person from this evolutionary perspective. And it's, it's really insightful. 
Yeah, it, it just it gives us this completely different perspective rather than having to make up a story de novo of where mm-hmm. this, why this exists. You know, if you talk to an evolutionary biologist about it, you'll, you'll get a lot more insight. And and to, do you want to go into the sinuses a little more? Or we can save that for yeah, our let's article. Because I think it's a good it's a good example of how just because something does something for us now doesn't mean that that's what it was evolved to do, for example, or that it gave enough benefit to have really been considered an adaptation. So yeah, let's talk about the sinus. So as far as what they do now, it seems like they do nothing, right? What they do is they they secrete mucus which then gets pushed in a very specific direction, actually against gravity and for some of the sinuses, into mm-hmm. the nose, it drips down the back of your throat, and then you swallow it. It's called mucociliary flow. And, and I mean, it could be that you need that mucus in order to have enough of a mucus blanket to swallow your food, to lubricate your food, so it actually goes down the esophagus. But I really, I find it unlikely. You could just upregulate the mucus that's produced in your nose and your throat in order to have enough. So That was always my question, was that, if the chambers are just there to to provide surface area for mucus production, that would be one thing. But it doesn't seem to me that they're necessary for that. But that's where your perspective would be key here. I mean, that's not the only place where, certainly where there are mucus membranes, but also where there's mucus production, correct? No, there's mucus production all, you know, all over the inside of your nose and the inside of your mouth, which should be more than enough. And if it isn't, then you can upregulate it. And you just, Mm -hmm. and you would still need to swallow the same amount. It's not like you would start drowning because you're producing too much mucus because, you know, you're producing the same amount of mucus, just more localized. And we don't find if someone has large sinuses or small sinuses, some people have atrophic sinuses, that they really have a deficit because of it. Some people don't have frontal sinuses. So the forehead sinuses, they Mm -hmm. just don't have them. And right. it's fine. They don't have any type of a deficit. Some, one thing that we used to do, and we really don't do it anymore, is if you'd have chronic frontal sinus infections, we'd actually obliterate the sinus. So you'd scrape all the mucous membrane out of the... I mean, it turns out that that can turn into a disaster. So we don't do that anymore. As you, far so as you mean removing the, like the sub-mucosa so that it does, nothing comes back? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You're like, like scarring it. You'd pack it with fat to just fill it up. But if you left a single cell behind, then you'd mm-hmm. end up in a mucosil with a mucosil in that area, and that would be problematic. So, but still, they would have complications from the surgery itself, but not because they didn't have a sinus anymore. So it's, it right. doesn't seem like they really have a function anymore, but they can cause problems. And so something that you and I had spoken about was that you know, in our modern society, since we live on top of each other, we get a lot of, we get more colds than we did when we were hunter gatherers out in the field in a tribe of, you know, far fewer than we're around now. So you get a lot of colds and that can affect the sinuses. And some people, a cold turns into, it starts out as a viral and upper respiratory tract infection, turns into a bacterial sinus infection. And that can cause all, all sorts of problems that can cause brain abscesses and orbital abscesses. If, if only just um, or if you have asthma, it causes asthma exacerbations. Like th- these things can be dangerous. It rarely causes this, rarely causes the, the, the abscesses. But, you know, in terms of quality of life, you now, you, you know, you're not going to be someone that's going to be selected for because you've got this foul smell coming out of your nose. You lose your sense of smell. It's very uncomfortable. So, um, so you can live a long life with a chronic sinus infection, but, you know, you're probably not going to be, you're going to have a hard, harder time reproducing in that right. setting. So, so they have a, a liability to them, at least in a modern society. So the question is, where could they have come from and where could they, their function have been previously that they still exist now? Well, I think you've, you've, you, I think you've given us all the information to produce a pretty good working theory. First of all, I think that um, drawbacks of the sciences that you mentioned about infection and, and how, um, how the poor design and the poor drainage can, can make all of this, the symptoms of respiratory infections worse, all that's true, but I don't think it was a major plague on our species until we started living in higher population density. So before farming was invented, and remember, farming was just very recently invented, if you're, if you're used to the time, time scales that I, I work in. Um, so prior to that, population sizes were measured in the low hundreds, 150 to 250. So you just, you weren't ravaged by a cold virus very often. I mean, it went through, if it went through the population once, and that would have been it. It doesn't circle the globe and mutate and come back again and all this sort of never-ending onslaught of uh, viral infection. I just don't think that our prehistoric forebears were very sickly people with infectious disease because it just, it wouldn't have been passed around. It would have, you know, like I said, go through once and that's it. And with no host. And, and, and these, most of the groups were fairly isolated from one another, at least on timescales of years to decades, not, not over longer timescales, but 
So I don't think that we were passing around these infections. So I don't think it actually was all that much of a detriment until farming. And we have evolved very, very little since the 15,000 years ago that we started um, sort of being more sedentary and, and staying in one place. And, uh, that, and that's what farming allowed. So I don't think that we've even had enough time to experience the selection pressure. And even, even then, even if we do think of this as a major detriment to us, we've sort of escaped natural selection in that way. We don't really live and die and succeed or not based on how healthy we are that much anymore. Cultural evolution has so outpaced biological evolution over the last 15,000 years. And that's why you have like, you know, the Habsburgs of, of, of Europe were tremendously successful in their reproductive capacity. But because of their own poor reproductive choices, they were a very sickly group, right? I mean, the Habsburgs, their face wasn't even formed correctly. Talk about the sinuses. And yet, because of the way that, that power uh, leads to reproductive success in our species, it didn't, it didn't affect them uh, in terms of their reproductive success. And I think that, you know, you map that phenomenon all the way back 15,000 years. I don't think that the common cold was just very much of a selective pressure. Even sinus infections would have to be very serious before they really affected your ability to reproduce. Well, even a lot of sinus infections, bacterial sinus infections are self-limited. So just because you have a sinus infection doesn't necessitate antibiotics, but we do we do often treat them. So, so then where did the sinuses come from? The short answer is that our sinuses are related to the sinuses that all mammals have, but they, almost all mammals have them in their snouts, okay? And so every mammals outside of primates are snouted. If you think about a horse, a kangaroo, a dog, even bears, you have all of this room in the snout and that's where these large cavities can concentrate millions upon millions upon millions of olfactory receptors. So the purpose of the snout is to really heighten the sense of smell. And that's why they have so many more kinds of olfactory receptors as well. Every other mammal outside of primate is really driven by its sense of smell. And so the snout had enormous advantages and they navigate their world through all the, the odorant receptors that they, that they have there. Well, in primates, we represented a transition towards vision uh, as the primary sense that we navigate the world, away from smell and towards vision. And those two did end up in tension. It would be great if we had kept the sense of smell while we developed vision, but here's why that wasn't possible. To really get the best view of the world, you don't put your eyes on the side like horses and everything else. That's great for a wide field of view, but you have very little overlap between the two fields of views of your eyes. And the overlap is what allows you good three-dimensional uh, stereoscopic vision at a distance. So if you bring the eyes forward, you have your visual feel, field covered by two eyes, you get good depth perception. The problem with that is if you bring your eyes forward and you don't reduce your snout, that snout is right in the middle. It's right in the middle of your field of view. So what primates did, while the eyes migrated forward, the snout regressed and it got smushed in to our face, essentially. And that was great because it got it out of the way, and, but it reduced our reliance on uh, smell, our ability to smell that well. And that was okay because we were transitioning towards vision. So there was really not, not that big of a drawback. Um, and more evidence for this, by the way, is found in the fact that most of our olfactory receptors have now been lost. They're all pseudogenes, not all of them, but we have several, actually, I, I forgot the numbers. I was just looking this up the other day, but I think it's over a thousand olfactory receptor pseudogenes. So these genes have been broken by mutation, but, but there was no effect because we're, we're not really driven by our sense of smell anymore. So as the snout regressed into the face, those sinus cavities still existed and they just got smushed up into the bones of our face. And so if you ask me why we have sinuses, it's because our ancestors did. It's not because they perform any important function for us. We can breathe through our mouth just fine. And in fact, anytime you do strenuous exercise, you're most, you're, most of the air is coming in through your mouth, and yet you don't have any um, terrible effects of that. So I would, I would argue that the sinuses do seem to be fairly vestigial in the sense that they were important to our ancestors. They're not important to us, but they weren't removed by evolution because evolution doesn't fix every mistake. Yeah, you have to have enough pressure. And without that pressure, then, then, it, then it just stays. The other apes did the same thing we did, but they, they handled it better. So, the, for example, the orangutans ditched some of their sinuses, that, some of the paranasal sinuses. They just ditched them all together. Somehow they did get lucky, and the mutations sort of eliminated those sinus cavities. So the orangutans got the best end of this deal. Chimpanzees have a very similar arrangement that we have, but yet the drainage um, from the maxillary sinuses in particular is wider and it's also higher up in the chamber, so it doesn't, so the mucus does, isn't allowed to pool at the bottom as much. So they have better drainage. They don't suffer sinus infections like we do. They don't live in the population densities that we do. Yeah, either. they don't get colds. 
Or maybe yeah, they don't. Fun. Yeah, no, you don't no see a they, they chimp that. with the sniffles often. Yeah, not really. And in fact, um, your dog also, you know, is a good example. They never really have upper respiratory issues unless you're talking about a breed who we have smushed their sinuses, like the pugs and Pekingese. And that should tell you something, actually, that <laughs> that the smushed up sinuses really are a breeding ground for for infection. And that's what we have, essentially. We're, we are pugs in, in terms of how our sinuses were just sort of very quickly smushed into our face uh, and, and suboptimally designed thereafter. I, I will be sure to tell that to my next patient with a sinus infection. You are a pug of the human race. Yeah. <laughs> that, will, that will go poorly. One star Yelp sure. review. <laughs> that was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.